when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the waves covered the ship, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him, awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, for we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith? He arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? I want to say good evening to all of you, and I trust and pray that you've had a wonderful day. I trust that you are well, that you're healthy, that you are not just well and healthy on the physical side, but I pray that you are well and healthy on the spiritual side as well. 
In fact, I pray that even if you are not healthy physically, you are healthy on the spiritual side. Uh, we cannot always determine what's going to happen to our physical bodies, but for certain we can determine what's going to happen with our spiritual man. And so it's good to have you with us on tonight. I trust and pray that things have already gone well and that you are ready to study God's word now as we prepare to go into this lesson on tonight. I want to set my timer to make sure that I not go over. So we want to encourage you please to get your Bibles. And if you're visiting with us, we welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. Again, you are aware of the fact that we're not live streaming from our church auditorium. I just remind you of this each week because there may be new individuals who are tuning in for the first time and want you to know that we are not live streaming because of the extensive water damage that was done to our facility uh, after the freeze. So we pray that you would continue to pray for us that we can get that situation completely under control and that we will eventually be back in our facilities. We understand that it will be quite some time, but we will be doing other things in preparation to bring the church together. So we will inform you of exactly what that is as we move forward. I, I want to encourage you now, as we prepare to go into this message, I'm going to ask that you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. And before we start our message, we want to ask that you would bow with me for a word of prayer. And we want to encourage you to think about all of those who are ill at Eastside, all of those who perhaps are ill in other congregations that you are aware of, and all of your family members who are in need of prayer. And I trust and pray that as we pray together, you would be called on the Lord for all of those individuals. And collectively our prayers are rising up to the Lord as a sweet smelling savor, as incense in the old covenant, as it would rise up, it was representative of the prayers of the, the saints of God, of the people of God. And so we want our prayers to rise up to God and that our prayers be a sweet aroma in the nostrils of God. That is, of course, a metaphor. We know God is not like us, but he's speaking on our terms. And we pray that as you pray along with me, that God will receive our prayers and answer them according to his will. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, our creator, our maker, our redeemer, the sustainer of all of life, for in you we live, we move, and we have our very being. Without you, Lord, there is no us. Without you, Lord, there is no living. Without you, Lord, there is no existence. Because we know that you are the one who created us. You did it, Lord. You created this world. And it exists because of you, and you hold it together. Were it not for you, Lord, this universe, this world could not and would not exist. And so we thank you, Lord, for being such an awesome God, for being such an omnipotent God, an omnipresent God, an omniscient God. We thank you, Lord for all that you are and for all that you do. Because of your greatness, because of your awesomeness, Lord, we know that there is nothing at all that we can ask you that you cannot accomplish. We know, Lord, that you can do anything but fail. We know, Lord, that you are in control. And if you will it to be, it will be, and there is no power in heaven and earth that can stop it. And so, Lord, we pray that your will be done in our lives. 
Lord, we are looking to you for answers, for solutions to our world's problems. Lord, we still have a, a highly divided country. We pray, God, that somehow or another unity can be found, something that we can all stand upon. Perhaps it's just the fact that we're all Americans and that we want what is best for this country, no matter what banner one flies under. Lord, may we all understand that we are a part of the United States of America. And though we don't all see everything alike, there is strength in diversity and there can be unity even in diversity because we don't have to see everything alike, but yet we can be one and work toward a common goal. And that is for the good of humanity and the good of our nation. And so Lord, we pray that we'll work together and not fight against one another, that it will not be just about politics, but it'll be about the people. And Lord, we pray now for this vaccine or these vaccines, since now we have more than one, we have three, I understand. And Lord, we, we pray for those vaccines that they are not harmful and will not do harm to anyone. And so far, Lord, what we've heard has been good. And we thank you for the technology and for the intelligence that you've given unto man so that we might be able to help ourselves in those areas that we're able to help ourselves because we know that if it is good, it has come from you. For every good and perfect gift is from above comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no bearableness, neither shadow of turning. And so Lord, now we pray for every sick person. We pray for every person in this congregation who is ill at East Side. We pray God, not only for them, but we pray for others outside of East Side. We care about all of the sick, not just our own. But we ask, Lord, that in a very special way that you would raise up those who are in your house at East Side, who have been ill, who have been diagnosed with a horrific disease and the prognosis does not look well. We know, Lord, that you are the great physician and that ultimately you have the final say. And so, Lord, I pray that you would please Lift the burdens off of the shoulders of your children who are ill. And Lord, we pray for this lesson on tonight. We pray, God, that what we say will be consistent with your word, that it will be true, and that it will be clear. Lord, I pray that you would guide me, guide my words, guide my thoughts. Lord, and pray, I pray, I pray that I will simply be a tool, a conduit through whom you speak to your people on tonight. And I pray that someone's faith will be encouraged, someone's faith will be strengthened, and they'll be a different person for the good when this class is over. Lord, we love you. We ask your blessings upon us and upon this class. In the powerful and mighty name and this precious and sweet name of Jesus, we do pray and ask these blessings, amen. All right, I wanna encourage you to please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, we're going to look at that as we share with you our screen. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I will share with you a portion of the chapter and then we'll go into it. The Bible says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, 
So the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life, of free of life, the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So friends, we're going to continue looking at Revelation chapter 21. We've already talked about the new heavens and the new earth. And I pray that we've done an extensive job and that you are now able to have a concept of what that is and that you are able to speak coherently about what is transpiring in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, what I'm going to do now is share with you my PowerPoint as we go through uh, the lesson on tonight, and I trust and pray that you will glean something from it that will bless your life. Now, I wanna look at, as we start this out, I wanna start out looking again at what John said relative to verse number three, when he talks about, and I heard a voice, a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So we talked about that a little bit last uh, Wednesday night. I just want to pick up here because I think this is a, a good place to pick up and I'm gonna move quickly through this. But we do not know who it was that spoke this because the Bible says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying. So John does not identify the voice. And so obviously at this point in time, that's not important. What is important is what was said by the voice as versus whose voice it was at this moment. Now, when he talks about Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, that he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Uh, this image, as I state here, is from the Old Testament. When God dwelt among Israel in the presence of the tabernacle. You remember that Moses went up on the mountain to receive the pattern for the tabernacle and God told him to make sure that he made all things according to the pattern. And so Moses came back down and they constructed the tabernacle exactly like God ordained that it should be constructed. And we can look at those passages, I will not do that, but those texts, Exodus 25, verses eight and nine, Exodus 29, verses 44 through 46, Exodus 40, verses 34 through 37, Numbers 2, 1 through 34, in particular, verse 17, and 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. All of these will give you a composite picture of the idea and the notion of God dwelling among his people or in the tabernacle 
And that gives you, those verses give you, they give you a, a concept of what's transpiring here. And so friends, I want you to understand that this is the image that John is drawing from as we look at Revelation chapter 21. Now, I gave you this last Wednesday night, I want to share with you again how this was originally among God's people when God had them to set up camp. And you can read those passages that I just gave you. When God had them to set up camp, you see the tabernacle is in the midst of the camp. And God had the 12 tribes located strategically around the tabernacle so that the tabernacle was in the center of the camp. And so you had three on the north, three on the east, three on the south, and three on the west. So you had the tabernacle in the midst of God's people and you had God as it would be represented in curse in some form or fashion in this tabernacle in the midst of his people. So obviously the tabernacle could not hold God no more than the temple could hold God. But there was, of course, the essence of God's Shekinah glory in that tabernacle. And so it was situated so that everyone in Israel would look to the tabernacle, which was symbolic of the presence of God in their midst. And so what is God trying to teach them? God is trying to teach them that I am in your midst. I am here for you to take care of you, to provide for you, and to protect you and to guide you. So God was all of those things to his children. So this is the concept that we find in Revelation chapter 21 when it talks about God is in the midst of his people. So what is the point? God and his people will forever be together in infinite fellowship and communion. They will never be separated from God ever again. We will never be separated from God ever again. So the separations that divided us are no longer. The real issue here is this. God is the reward and not the land that we're in. Now, I know we talk about heaven as being the reward, but what makes heaven heaven? What makes heaven heaven is the presence of God. You know, the absence of God is hell. And so when you have not God and there is no God there, then that is hell because it is without hope. There is no hope. And so when a person is in that place of condemnation, that means they are absent from God and God is absent from them. There is no hope ever. But when we talk about God being in the midst of his people, the point is that God is our ultimate reward. We are ultimately with him. We're not going to heaven or being in this place that the Bible refers to as heaven and here as the new heaven and the new earth. We're not going there just to so, so we can walk on a street of gold. We're not going there to see this city that is so pristine, pure, that the Bible talks about it as if it was pure crystal that you could see through it. This gold, this transparent gold as it would be. God is trying to relate these images to us. We're not going to heaven to look upon gates of pearls and walls of jasper. That is not the point is we are going to be forever in the presence of God in reality. In reality. Right now, we know God is with us, but we cannot physically see God. Right now, we know that the Lord is present, but we cannot in any way through any of our senses experience God in that manner. But what John is telling us in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number three is that God 
is in our midst. We have finally made it to that place where there is nothing and no one who separates us from God ever. Now, that was the key. And Mo Moses even understood that in the, the book of Exodus, he understood that the key was not the promised land, but it was God being with them in the promised land. And we're gonna go back to Exodus chapter 33, and I'm gonna read verses one, two, and three, and then gonna drop down to verse number 12 through 17. So Exodus chapter 33, Exodus chapter 33, let me pull that up. Exodus 33. All right, hey, give me just a second and we'll get it done. Exodus 33 and verse number one. The Bible says, then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go down from here. Moses was on the mountain and God says, you need to go back down the mountain to the people. He says, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I want you to depart and go from here. You and your people or the people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt to go to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying to your descendants, I will give it. Now watch this. And I will send my angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Now watch this. God says, I am not going with you into that land. But watch what Moses said. The reason why God said specifically because of your rebellion. And I don't want to destroy you. I'm going to keep my promise that I made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And so watch this now. And the Bible says, if you drop down to verse number 12 and watch what Moses said. In verse number 12, the Bible says, then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Watch this. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separated your people and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And so Moses said, and the Lord said to Moses, rather, I will also do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. Now, notice what Moses said. Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with us, <laughs> then we don't wanna go into that land. Verse number 15, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. In other words, we want to be where you are, God. And if you, and you got to keep in mind, we are still speaking in the sense of an anthropomorphism given of human-like characteristics to divinity, because we know that God is an omnipresent God. But what he's trying to communicate is simply this, that 
if God does not go with them in the sense of his blessings upon them, his protection upon them, his provision for them, if God is not going to be with them, then he does not want to leave where he is with God at the mount where God gave them the covenant that is Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. So understand this. Moses understood way back then that the promised land really means nothing if God is not with us. So what good is quote unquote milk and honey? What good is it to have all of these wonderful produce at our disposal? What good is it to have all of these gardens that we did not plant and, and, and houses that we did not build? What good is all of that stuff if it is absent of God. And so Moses understood that the treasure is really not the land, but the one who created the land, and that is God. And so friends, heaven is only heaven because God is there, <laughs> amen. Heaven is only heaven because we will be with our eternal creator, forever, and we will be able to look upon him with our eyes and see only what we once could read about. What a glorious day that will be. What a marvelous day that is going to be. And so ladies and gentlemen, he talks about that new heaven and new earth, but then he talks about the fact that God is going to be in the midst of his people. And so that is the key. God is going to be in our midst. So there will never again be any separation by anything or anyone. That will be a hallelujah shouting moment when we're finally in that place. In verse number four, John said, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain for the former things have passed away. I talked about that last week, so I'm not going to go back through that. It's just a beautiful picture of God as a loving, caring father with his children. He is among his people, wiping away their tears. And the message is not that God literally has a handkerchief wiping away their tears. That's not what God is doing. But the message is that God is going to permanently wipe out any condition and every condition that would ever cause any kind of pain and suffering for his children. So God is going to remove all of that. Consequently, there will never be a need to cry anymore. So God would have changed this present world and all of the things that bring us sadness, discontentment, anxiety, fear, frustration, anger, all of those things will be no more. As I indicated last week, it is the land of the no mores. No more sickness, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crime, no more politics, no more bills, no more taxes, no more hatred, no more envy, no more life insurance, health insurance, house insurance, repairs, tiredness, weariness, anxiety, anger, jealousy, and whatever else you can list that ultimately causes us to have difficulties in this present world, those things will be no more. Now look at verse number five. He says, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, but these words are true and faithful. What a beautiful thought. He says now, and behold, I make all things new. Clearly, we don't have to question whose voice this is. This is God. God is the one who makes this statement. I make all things new. We know that because the Bible says, he who sat on the throne. God is the one who sits on the throne. Christ sits on the throne with him, the Father. But notice now, ladies and gentlemen, 
it comes from the throne. So either way you look at it, either way you cut it, either way you slice it, God is the one who spoke this truth. He said, I make all things new. Only God has the capacity to do what is spoken of here in verse number five. When he says, I make, that verb make is in the present tense. The sense of, I am making all things new. The significant significance is simply this. Even though it is future to us, it is already with God. Amen and hallelujah. So the significance is our future is God's already. This is what you need to understand. There is the notion in scripture that is often portrayed. It is called, in essence, the already in the not yet. God has already prepared something for us, but as far as we are concerned, we do not yet possess it. In the literal sense, we don't possess it. We possess it by promise and by faith. But literally, we don't have possession of it now. But it exists right now. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what a beautiful thing to think about that God is saying to us, though we do not literally possess heaven, heaven is already ours. He's already promised it to us. It is ours to receive so it is ours in the sense that it is the already in the not yet. What a beautiful thought. Do you, already, do you not know that you already have property in heaven as it would be? And I'm just using this as terminology to communicate that we already have an inheritance, that we already have a place that set aside for us in that new place with our names on it. What a blessing that is to know that God has something set aside already for me, though I have not yet taken hold of it in the literal sense. But that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It is about telling God's people to hold on, hold on, because what you are striving for already exist. And all you need to do is just finish the race. So I don't know what has you discouraged tonight, but I would say to you simply this, whatever it is, it is not worth giving up on the Lord, his church and his promises. See, everything that we're going through now is temporary. It will pass. But God has something that is eternal for us that will never pass away. John says, behold, I make all things new. God says, I'm making them new. He who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. When we look at the word new, it is the Greek word kainos, which again, as he talks about the new heavens and the new earth, it is that same Greek word, and it means new in quality. What does that mean? I made a difference between neos, meaning new as far as coming into existence right now. It's brand new. No, what God has created for us has been created. And, and all we've got to do is just go and possess what God has already made for us. So it's not like it's going to come into existence in the sense of now it becomes a reality that it never existed before the end of time. No, sir, no, ma'am. What God has done for us has already, in essence, been done. That is, in the mind of God, it is as good as done. So when we talk about this newness, it's not 
new in the sense of just off the assembly line, but it's new in the sense that it is new to us and it is a new quality. In other words, there is nothing in this world you can compare to what God has prepared for us. Now, I want you to think about that because you know I've I've seen some beautiful, awe-inspiring things. I've seen the creation of God, the majestic and mighty mountains, the mysterious sky and the clouds the stars and the moon and the sun. I've seen the beautiful flowers that God has decked the earth with and the carpet of grass that he's laid out over this planet and the tall trees that point up to their maker. Trees that are so tall that they make us look small. The mighty redwoods in California. I'm just trying to tell you in the mighty mountains that pierce into the heavens. I've seen some beautiful and grand things, but there is nothing that can compare to heaven. There is nothing. I have, I have seen the Grand Canyon. I've seen the Mediterranean. I've seen a lot of beautiful things and seen a lot of things that just made me stand as it would be with my mouth open saying, wow. I've seen some things that baffle the mind when it comes to beauty, art that is beautiful. I remember my wife and I standing in one of the uh, old cathedrals there in, in Italy and we were in Venice and it was St. Mark's Church, if I remember correctly, it may not be exactly right, but uh, it was one of the cathedrals that we were in and they were talking about the mosaic ceiling and how it took a hundred years to complete it. One generation would die off and another would take it up and complete it. And it was a, a mosaic and, and everything that we were looking at was made out of, were made out of small pieces of glass, no larger than a fingernail. And to look at it was grandiose. It was amazing. And I'm saying I've seen some spectacular buildings, cathedrals, castles, mansions, all of these things I've seen that have baffled my mind. And I, just, I would have to just say, wow. But what God has prepared for us, there is no comparison. It's new in quality. And friends, listen to me. That's why there is nothing in this world that's worth losing your soul over. Money, material things, that's insane. All of these things are gonna be left behind. They are perishable. But what we have in heaven is imperishable. So it makes no sense to lose my soul over a few dollars. It makes no sense for me to lose my soul just so that I can have another house that's larger than the one that I live in now, or drive a more fancy car, or wear more fancy clothes, or dine out at more fancy restaurants. What does all of that mean when it's going to pass away? But if we put all of our time investing everything that we have in this world, not looking to the world to come, all we're doing is what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 16, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? So friends, it's not about what we have in this world. It's about what we have in the world. And so John said, this is going to be new. Nothing we know in this world can compare to it. Its newness will never wear off because in eternity, there is no time. Time is no more. It will never grow old and neither will we ever grow old. And we will never get tired of heaven. 
I think I said last week that when we're, when we're in heaven, every day, though I'm using terminology that does not exist, because you can't say every day when there is nothing but one continuous existence. And, and so it is not time, but I'm just trying to express this in the best way that I can to make a connection. In that place, it will be using time after a billion years, just as if it were the first day that we entered into that place and to that existence. So there will not be any whatsoever growing old in that city. Nothing wears out, nothing is eaten by moth, a rust will not decay it, nothing there will deteriorate. It is a city, it is a place that will never be corrupted or contaminated by anything or anyone. Hallelujah. It will always be new. And we will always be new. We are new. Listen, although life will be qualitatively different, there is some form of continuity or link in that we are still who we are. And so there is some continuity between the old and the new in the sense that we do not cease to be who we are, but there is a difference in us because we are new. But it's not new as if we are just coming into existence, but new in quality because we will still be we we will be we will still be who we are. George Michael Williams will still be George Michael Williams. Gail will still be Gail. Whatever your name is, you will still be that person. But the quality of life and everything that you exist in will be new. Even the body that you will occupy will be new. Let's look at that because I want you to see this. The continuity is as follows. We will still be us. We will have new bodies. Uh, and this is what you need to understand. So we're going to occupy God's new creation, but we're going to occupy this new creation as new creations in new bodies. Lord have mercy. Because right now as new creations, we are now occupying this present creation, this world now, but we are made to live as new creations in Christ Jesus in a new creation that is totally qualitatively different. All right, let's look now at these passages, if you will. We're going to begin looking at Philippians chapter three, verse 17 through 21, I want you to see that we will be who we are, but we will have a new existence. We will exist in a new body that will not be corrupted or deteriorated. We will never grow old. So when we say he makes all things new, I want you to understand that that newness will never cease to be. All right, let's look at, if you will, uh, Philippians, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse number 20, 17. The Bible says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for us a pattern. For many walk whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame. Who set their mind on earthly things for our citizenship is in heaven 
from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, watch this now, who will transform our lowly body that we may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whether you realize it or not, Paul said, when Jesus comes again, these bodies will be transformed. These lowly bodies will be changed and will be conformed to Christ's glorious body. It's hard for us to fathom this, but I'm gonna say this and I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Do you not realize what God gave up for us? You don't realize what God gave up for us. You don't realize what Christ gave up for us. God gave his only son. Christ, who ever, forever in eternity existed as eternal spirit with the Father, one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but the son was incarnate. He fully took upon us our humanity. He did not cease to be God as some would want to teach. That's an Arian heresy that the, that the early church already fought against and defeated. And there are still those who would teach this lie that Jesus was not God in the flesh. He was just a man. That is a lie, that is heresy. And anyone who teaches such, they're teaching something that is damnable. That's 2 John 9. If any come unto you and, and bring not this doctrine, that's the doctrine that God, that God in Christ was manifested in the flesh. So watch this now. Jesus did not just appear to be a man. He fully took upon us our humanity. And he died on the cross. And when he rose, he did not rise as a spirit. He rose in bodily form. But when he rose in bodily form, he rose with that new glorified resurrection body. And that's the body that he ascended back into heaven with. So he forever, forever, forever has taken upon himself us. Watch this now. He could not go back into the form that he had prior to because he gave that up, but God still glorified him and he is seated at the right hand of the Father on high. You need to understand that's the price that Christ was willing to pay for your redemption and my redemption. And dare we think we're giving up something just because we got to quit a habit or let go of a person or let go of a job or just because we had to stop doing something that was pre precious to us. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus gave his all to save us. The Father gave his best to save us. And so when we rise, we will rise in a resurrected body that will be the same as the glorified body of Jesus Christ. Now watch, if you will, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're gonna look at verse number 42, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're gonna look at verse number 42, 15 and verse 42. The Bible says, and we go back to New King James. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That is Jesus Christ. Now, friends, the Bible says that these bodies will go into the grave corruptible. But when they come out, they will be incorruptible. They go in in dishonor, but they'll come out raised in glory. They go in in weakness, but they'll be raised in power. They go in as a natural body, but they will come out a spiritual body. But the key is body, body, soma. That's body. God is going to give us a body. That was my alarm telling me that I needed to start wrapping this up. So now watch this. God is telling us that we are going to have a new body, but it will be a body and it will be us. How that will be and how it will look and how we'll look. I'm not certain about that, but it will be us. Watch this, if you will. Uh, I'm going to keep reading verse number 46. The Bible says, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. And so Adam, then came the second Adam. Watch this now. Now, what we are looking for is that spiritual body, not that natural body. For the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. In other words, what he looks like now, we will look like as well. That glorified body that Christ ascended back into heaven with is the same kind of body that we will possess at resurrection. And I'll show you that in just a few minutes as we continue to look at this idea of what's going to happen when we enter into that new place that God has prepared for us. In verse number 50, this new place, as I said, requires that we be new. We are new creation in this world, meaning that there is something about this world that just doesn't fit right with us because we don't belong here permanently. And so God says, I'm going to change what you are now from the physical side so that it'll match your spiritual side, new creation, and prepare you for that new creation that I have qualitatively prepared for you. And when you go to that place, you can't take this stuff. Listen to what he says. Now, this I say, brethren, verse 50, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This cannot go to heaven. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a new body. That's the continuity. We will be the same people, but not the same body. Yet we will have a body, but it will not be a corruptible body. It will still be us, yet it will be different. Brother Williams, that doesn't make any sense. Well, don't worry about it. Listen to First John. Listen to First John chapter 3, verses 1 
2 and 3. First John chapter 3, and this should, should seal the deal for you and help you to understand that you don't have to fully understand it. Watch this now. John says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that in and that is what we are. We are children of God. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Watch this. But we know, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Ladies and gentlemen, John said, I'm not certain exactly what we're going to be like, but one thing I do know is we will be like him. We will see him as he is. So this body that we will have will be qualitatively different. You remember when Jesus rose in his glorified body, Jesus was able to walk through closed doors. He could do it. In that glorified body, yet it was a body, and yet it was him. He says, this is a body, but it's not a spirit. It's not a ghost. He says, touch me, handle me, for a spirit has not flesh and bones. And so Jesus was able to walk through physical things. Yet he was in a body. We will be like Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know what all that means, but I do know this. I'm looking forward to that day. And not only that, you remember when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus and he was talking to those disciples on that road. And ladies and gentlemen, they didn't recognize Jesus as he walked with them until that moment that the blinders were removed. And then you remember in the Gospel of John when, when, when Jesus was standing on the banks of the Sea of Galilee and he prepared breakfast as it would be for his disciples. They didn't recognize him at first, but then they said, this got to be him. But the blinders were removed when they broke bread with him. Great message there. I don't have time to delve into it. All I want you to understand is simply this that God has prepared for us a new body. That new body will be given to us on that day when the Lord shall get us out of the grave. Or if we're still living, he will change us and he will take us to that place that is called the new heavens and the new earth. We will have a qualitatively different existence in this qualitatively different place. Why in the world would you want to miss that for the pleasures of this world? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to close now. Perhaps I said something that will cause you to think about your relationship with God. Perhaps you have lost sight of what God has prepared for you. And I trust tonight that I have at least made you think about it again. How glorious is this place that God has prepared for us. And we just need to hold on because heaven is ours. God has an inheritance for us. And in that place, we will be who we are. We will have a new existence and we will never ever grow old. And heaven will never grow old. If you believe that Jesus Christ came, suffered, bled and died for your sins, that he was buried and that he rose again. If you're willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, three and five, Acts 17, 13, 31. If you're willing to confess the name of Jesus Christ, Romans 10, nine and 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then be baptized, Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, three and four, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, into Christ, Galatians three and verse number 27.
Romans 6, 3 and 4. And the Lord in heaven will save you by his grace and he'll add you to his marvelous church. You'll be a Christian, child of God, a member of the Lord's body. I want to encourage you to do that. Please get in touch with us at the Church Christ at East Side, and we will gladly respond to you. And we will do that as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. I trust that you'll have a wonderful night. God bless each and every one.